and we'll be reading John 1, 1 through 4. Again, that's John 1, 1 through 4. When you get there, say amen. No amen yet? <laughs> amen. Amen. All right, here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word this morning. Amen. Our sermon title is The Eternal Christ, and I'm going to have a word of prayer as we begin. Loving Father in heaven, send the Holy Spirit here. He's the only one who can really reveal Jesus and his majesty to us touching our hearts and minds and increasing and inspiring our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our scripture reading this morning is really uh, descriptive. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. And we know from chapter, uh, verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that's Jesus. So according to the SDA Bible commentary, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Greek word for was is in, to be expressing continuity of existence or being. Continuity. The Word was throughout all eternity. He never became such. That's the SDA Bible Commentary, uh, 5, page 896. The Bonds Commentary in Vengeance Word Study says, absolute existence. Jesus had absolute existence. And I didn't put one up here. It was Robertson Word Pictures, continuous existence. That makes Jesus an eternal being. He's always existed. There's never a time when he didn't exist. He's always been there. As we go on to the rest of our scripture reading this morning, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So what does this make him? The creator. So what does John do? John is really pulling out the heavy artillery. You know, it's like in a batting order, you put your, fours, your four big best bats all right up there, one after the other. He's, that's what he's doing here. He's putting, he's loading up. John here, one, Jesus always existed. There was never a time when he wasn't around. Two, he's the creator, the maker of everything. And as we go on here, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So what was in him? Life. It was his by nature. It was his substance as an eternal being. So in a sense, it's almost duplicating verse 1. The word was continually always with God. And then back here on this end, it says, in him was life. And that's why he could be with God for all eternity. And the life was the light of men. So we see here that Jesus was in the beginning as a creator. In him was life, the light of men. So Jesus is an eternal, all-powerful being. So what does that mean for us individually? I think it's called security, faith, trust, right? When you're worshiping someone like that, like we learned the long view of prophecy this morning, God has it all in control. So Jesus' nature is immortal, not subject to death. Our nature is mortal. Paul in Colossians uh, according to the Amplified Version here, I'm going to use some uh, different Bible versions because they seem to be more descriptive of the original language. Talking about Jesus, and Paul was writing, and he himself existed before what? All things. And in him all things consist. Some Bibles say, in him all things hold together. So not only is he the creator, but if he's holding thing, everything together, 
He's also the maintainer. That means from the smallest molecule to all the galaxies in this universe, he is the one, his guiding hand is directing everything. He keeps everything together, everything together. In the uh, amplified versions for everything in him consists, it has cohair. And that's a mass that resists separation and is held together. So Jesus created everything and he holds everything together. Now I want to ask you today, is your life coming unraveled? Do you feel like you're falling apart? Things aren't working quite the right way? Who's the ones who's going to bring it back together? Jesus. Jesus. He can recreate you. That same creative power that he made the world will give you a new heart. And then when things in this world get crazy and we think we're just going to fall apart, Jesus has the ability to what? Strengthen us. Give us wisdom. Hold us together. Help us to get through it. So life has its storms. But when the storm hits, who's in the boat? Jesus is in the boat with us, helping us make it through. So that's the one we are, we are worshiping. Here's Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 530. Lazarus gets sick. He dies. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. Mary and Martha were the, brothers, were the uh, sisters. Jesus waits four days, finally shows up. Martha comes on and says, hey, if you'd been around, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. But here's what she says. Still seeking to give a true direction to her, Martha's faith, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life, period. Now here's Ellen White's comment. In Christ is what? Life. Going back to John 1.1. And then she fleshes this out. Original, unborrowed, underived in him was life is life original unborrowed underived he that has the son hath life the divinity of christ is the believer's assurance of eternal salvation so what divinity is the assurance of our eternal salvation jesus is life original unborrowed underived so why is that so important that Ellen White in Desire of Ages actually expands what it means that in him was life and what, what it really getting at? Well, when you take a look original, first, existing first, from the beginning, or before other people or things, new, completely new, and so not copied or derived for something else. So... Jesus' eternal nature, where did it come from? Did it come from his father? It was just his, just by his substance. How do we explain that? We know the Father is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal, and now we have Jesus. It's just him. You can't really explain it. The says there's says no, there's no figures long enough, I mean numbers, you can't make a number long enough to even grasp how long Jesus has been around. That's amazing that in him, original, unborrowed, borrowed to get temporary possession or use of something belonging to somebody else, usually uh, after asking permission, Jesus did not receive his eternal nature from someone else, it wasn't borrowed. God didn't say, oh, I'm going to make you, here, you just take a little of this and now that's you. He didn't need that. He had it. He has it now. You know the God we are worshiping, our Messiah, last time I was here, who was Jesus the Messiah? Our Messiah is an eternal, everlasting, all-powerful being who has creative power and he has life in him. So where do we get eternal life? In our good works? Paying tithe? How do we get eternal life? It is a gift from God. So the life he has that's eternal, he gives it to us. He lives forever, and when you love Jesus, he'll give it to you as a gift so you can live forever. So 
It wasn't borrowed anywhere, and it was not, and it's underived. Derived means get or come from something, to obtain something or come from a source. Jesus is the sole source of his eternal nature. So when Jesus is life original, unborrowed, underived. Jesus says, I am the resurrection of life. This language can only be used by the who? The deity. All created things live by the will and power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of the Son of God. However able and talented, however large their capabilities, they are replenished with life from the source of what? All life. Every morning when, you, when your eyes open up, that's Jesus giving you the ability to wake up. Your heart pumping, your lungs expanding, your body working, that's the power of Jesus. He's the one who, 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 is, who is actually orchestrating that. Only he who alone hath immortality dwelling in the light in life could say, I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it again. I'm going back here. Only he who alone has immortality. So she's saying here in Desire of Ages, Jesus, as part of the Godhead, has immortality. Dwelling in the light and life could say, I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it again. All the human beings in our world take their life from him, he is the spring and fountain of life. It's a gift he's given you. When the baby comes out and you get a little whap on the behind and it starts crying, God's power. God's power giving life to everything. From the youth instructor. Now, for our guest today, I'm using other, I'm using uh, Desire of Age Youth Instructor others. We had one of our pioneers, Ellen White. We feel that God has given her a gift to uh, help expound the Bible, not to replace the Bible, but to just amplify it for us some and give some insights. So she doesn't replace the Bible. Her name is Ellen White, and uh, she's one of the pioneers. And, and she wrote an article in the Youth Instructor. I am the resurrection of life. He who had said, I lay down my life that I might take it again, came forth from the grave to life that was in himself. How does a dead deity raise itself? Did he die on the cross? Didn't they want his body? And Pilate says, go find out, is he dead? Okay, soldier comes back, he's dead. They took him off, he was dead off the cross. They laid him in the tomb, he was dead. They rolled a boulder over there, he was dead. Right? Sunday morning, the boulder rolls back, and who's walking out? Jesus. He resurrected himself. Do you understand the power in the majesty, the glory, the massiveness of Jesus? The same power he raised himself is the same power he will raise you if you pass into the grave before he comes back. So we raise, he lays Lazarus after four, uh, four days. He was already decomposing. Jesus, after on the third day, he rose again by his own power the life that was in him. Then she continues on. Humanity died. Divinity did not die. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. He declared that he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. So Jesus had the power, and he told us that. I lay down my life, and I take it up again. He told him what was going to happen. And what happened? He came out. He came out of that grave victorious. And someday he will bring you out of that grave victorious. It's the resurrection from the dead because of what Jesus done is why we're here today, worshiping, worshiping him on the Sabbath. Because he gives eternal life. What does Paul say if the dead don't rise in Corinthians? We are what? Most miserable, pitiable people. Why are you even a Christian if Jesus doesn't have the gift of eternal life? So he gives it to us. That's why we're here. And that's why we obey him and follow him. And we're loyal to him. Walk with him day by day. Now, what happens to the, to the dead human body of a deity? What happened to Jesus' body from Friday night 
to Sunday morning. Here's a, Peter is actually quoting an Old Testament prophecy that he's applying to Jesus in the grave. For you will not leave my soul in Hades or the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see what? Corruption. You know what? Jesus was laying in that tomb and he wasn't even decaying. That's what the prophecy was. He wouldn't see corruption. Lazarus saw corruption when Jesus said, hey, roll away the tomb. His sister said, no way. He stinks because he was decomposing. The human body of a deity doesn't decay. That's what the promise was. The same power that kept Jesus' body from decaying, he, he died, but his divinity was still operating, is the same power that will keep you from decaying for all eternity. That's why we don't die. Jesus keeps us fresh every day. We don't age. We're not going to have diseases, right? No more pain, no more suffering, no more crying, no more tears for all eternity. The same power is going to be operating in us for eons upon eons, time immortal. That's amazing that God is going to do that for us. Then the Jews said to him, now, I've got a few more slides and then I'll be done. Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who do you think you are? Now, have you ever heard the, uh, the term or the saying, if you don't want to hear the answer, don't ask the question. So they asked a question that they really weren't ready to hear the answer to. They did. They weren't ready. They were just trying to make him look bad. Then, okay, here's what happens. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was... I am. Every mouth was gaping open, every eye was bulging, and everybody was completely still. Because they understood that could only go one way. They knew the story about Moses being brought up in Pharaoh's house. He killed an Egyptian. He had to flee for 40 years. He's up on Mount Horab, another name for Mount Sinai, 40 years as a shepherd, and there's a burning bush. Wow, that's a marvelous sight, and he wanted to get a little closer. No, don't come any closer. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. God says, go back to your people. Then Moses said to God, indeed, I will come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, and he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent, was sent to you. Jesus was claiming to be who when he told the Jews before Abraham was, I am. God in the fullest, highest sense. In the highest sense. I was the one in the burning bush talking to Moses. The complete word study Bible, it's a Bible dictionary of, of the Greek words, and it says here, I am that I am to breathe. This verb means to exist, to be, to become, to come, to pass, to be done, uh, to happen, to be finished. Listen to this. The, the key to the meaning of Jehovah Yahweh is undoubtedly found in this verb. Perhaps I am that I am should be translated, I am he who is, or I am he who exists. Basically, I just am. I'm just here. 
always have been. I live. I exist. I existed for all eternity, and the Jews got it. Desire of ages. With solemn dignity, Jesus answered, Very really, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of eternal presence. Well, how would you like to be in a, in a crowd and someone says, Oh yeah, I've always been around for all eternity. Uh, where's the white jacket? You know, call him. This guy needs to go. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of eternal presence has been claimed as his own by the Galilean rabbi. He had announced himself to be the self-existent one, he who had been promised to Israel. So they asked Jesus, who are you? Well, he gave them the answer, and the crowd got it. They got it. They understood clearly what he was saying. That's it. And here was the crowd's reaction. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. When you're a speaker and you say something and you think the people didn't understand what you said, you go, oh, I don't think they understand. Said, hey, wait a minute, let me rephrase this. Sometimes you may say something wrong. I think last year I was talking about the riches of God, and I said, oh, our God is filthy rich. And I just stopped. No, I'm taking that one back. I got us tremendously rich. You didn't get his riches from filth. I had to take that one back. You don't see Jesus taking it back. You just say, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't understand what I was saying. He didn't say that. He said, oh, wait a minute. Let me rephrase that. Oh, oh, I misspoke. He didn't do that. He stuck to what he said. And then he, he left. It wasn't his time to die. So he owned what he said, and he owned it because it was true the eternal God with eternal presence that we'll be living with for all eternity. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, I'm going to end right here and just make an appeal that we take a good hard look at Jesus It all that encompasses him, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, the Creator, the Life Giver, the Life Sustainer, an eternal being, who someday will take that eternity within himself and give it to all of us at the second coming. All the dead will raise out of their graves. Isaiah 26 says, be, if you die and you're a Christian, when you come out of the grave, it says you're going to be singing. Singing. Is that going to be a happy day? Why do people sing? Because Jesus is going to pay off on every promise. We who are alive and remain, we're going to be changed. This mortal will put on What? immortality. This corruptible will put on incorruption. Then death is a defeated enemy. So that's the value and beauty of Jesus. It's not found any other place. It's him, the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. The eternal son of God given as a gift to the human race to fix the mess Satan brought and to bring the whole universe back in harmony with the Father, including us, for all eternity. Would you like to live with Jesus for all eternity? Yes. He's going to do it. Has everything Jesus said come to pass? Yes. Before he went back, he asked them, any of you convict me of sin? Have I made a mistake? Have I said something inappropriately? Not one answer in the crowd. When they were accusing him of being uh, before Pilate and before Herod, of being a troublemaker and a rabble rouser, they had to bring in false witnesses. Because Jesus always told the truth. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and what? Receive you to myself. And that's why we're here waiting for the day when Jesus comes back for his people and then we enter his glorious kingdom. Let's have our closing hymn. We have a high 
high priest up in heaven. Hallelujah, oh hallelujah, he's our defender before the Father. In a temple made by God, not man. Behind the veil, in a place most holy. Hallelujah, oh hallelujah. Investigating, he clears the record of those redeemed by him. provision for me in the sanctuary he's purifying heaven's temple hallelujah oh hallelujah in preparation for his returning, for those who love and follow him, he's blotting out my sin in the sanctuary. He seals my sanctuary at the mercy seat in the holy of holies in the holy of holies we Thank you. 